you ask for it, I got it. Hello guys, Matthew here and welcome back again to my channel. After checking out Silentium PC's Regnum RG6V chassis, click here if you want to check it out. And during that time I already had my eye on their Signum SG1V and some of you actually asked me for its review. Before all, as it represents a very good balance of value for your money. And here it is standing right next to me, so let me first show you how my build in it went. Silentium PC is actually a Polish made brand and manufacturer. Some of you outside of Europe asked me where they could find and buy their chassis, but currently as far as I know that's not possible since they only sell in Europe, but I will definitely try to forward them your interest. So maybe they start their global market expansion soon, hopefully so because they do have some interesting value products. Anyhow, it's really noteworthy how Silentium PC still manages to find its own design language which is still different from others and that was one of the main reasons why this model caught my attention. The credit for that goes to this really cool looking almost supersized honeycomb mesh style grille on the front which looks even cooler once everything lights up. Above it we have your usual round down of connectors, nothing too flashy, just two USB 3.0 type A ports, 3.5mm audio in and out jacks and far away spaced from them on the other side, power on, reset switch and LED indicator light. The left side of the chassis carries a lightly tinted tempered glass side panel which has a bit of a clumsy implementation I would say, the thing is that it's not flashed with the chassis frame but it's just put onto it so it comes off like it was an afterthought which is a bit weird since the Regnum rg 6 v had a better solution. Pulling it off was pretty straightforward since we have 4 thumb screws in each corner while the glass sits on rubber grommets so it stays put when you remove all of the screws although I wouldn't practice doing that unsupervised for a longer period of time just to be on the safe side. Speaking of being safe, on the right side you won't have a problem like that since we have a good old fashioned inconspicuous flat side panel held by two thumb screws on the back. What's not held with screws are six of seven expansion slots on the back where you can unfortunately see that those are the ones that once you pull them off there's no backsies, it's off for good like picking out a telephone number from a flyer on a traffic light pole for a moving company service that you're never going to use. You will get one removable and with a screw reinstallable cover, too bad they don't provide you with like two additional ones in the bundle, I've seen that with some chassis. Back here on the top we have a IO shield cutout and a 120mm fan installation spot, while moving down to the lobby floor we have a place for a power supply which has a nice long and thick foam padding for it to be put on. The chassis is overall pretty light, especially when you remove the tempered glass side panel, so it's not to say that it's super sturdy or ruggedly made with extra thick metal sheets, but it does give away a decent build quality feel. Its dimensions are pretty compact, short and sweet would be the words I would pick for it, which does translate in some awkwardness when it comes to installing hardware in it. Knowing what kind of experience I had with the Regnum rg 6 v which is one of their also pretty downsized models, I was expecting something similar when it comes to the insides of the SG-1V and they would just slap on different exterior panels and that would be it but suffice to say that I was not completely right on that prediction. Here I'm mostly referring to the back part of the chassis while the inner main compartment is pretty much the same. We have somewhat this amount of space for doing a build, maybe a bit less since this chassis is around 20mm shorter in length compared to the Regnum RG-6V so it can get a bit tight in some places. We do have cutouts for the cables all around the motherboard tray, right, left and bottom and even one although not functional to showcase your power supply, unfortunately we don't have any rubber grommets for them, which ok I get it, it's a really budget chassis selling for less than 60 euros and has 4 ARGB 120mm fans, so there has to be some compromises, otherwise I would start to wonder how did they make any profit out of it. Speaking of those fans, as I said there's a total of 4 of them, 
three on the front and one on the back. There are Stella HP ARGB 120 millimeter models. All of these ones are actually not the 4-pin PWM models, but rather the 3-pin ones. While on their website they only have the PWM models, so I guess these ones come exclusively with the chassis. You have few options in terms of controlling them, being it when it comes to their speed or lighting. One option is actually the main side feature of this model, and that's the fact that it has a controller hub with connections for both the fans, where the headers on the hub itself are the 4-pin ones, and their ARGB lighting. From it we have two cables going directly to the motherboard, so you can collectively control both the speed and lighting over it, but in case you don't have any type of RGB header on your motherboard, Silentium PC does provide you with this handy dandy controller, which then lets you power the fans RGBs over a dedicated SATA power connection and control them using the reset switch on the chassis. Staying in this right side compartment, although you'll be greeted by a pretty messy stock cable situation, you'll have plenty of room in that in-between space to do a proper cable management. It's going to be a challenge and it's going to be hard to make it look decent, but it's doable. There are a few tie-down points on the back of the tray, so that alongside of getting a couple of zip ties from the bundle will make the whole process a bit easier. Let's jump over to storage options. We have two dedicated spots for the 3.5 inch drives in the drive cage found behind the power supply shroud and it can also of course take in 2.5 inch drives. The cage has two positions which you can move about depending on what you plan to use. If you opt in for a bigger radiator on the front which could dig into the bottom part of the power supply shroud, I suggest you push the cage on the second back position, although bear in mind that in that case it's better to have a shorter power supply because it's going to be a tight fit for the cables. The best thing you can do is just completely remove it like I did, since I didn't use any other drive beside my large enough M.2 SSD that covers all my needs. There's also two dedicated 2.5 inch drive spots behind the motherboard tray, which are probably, let's just say, one of the more interesting solutions I've seen so far, but bottom line, it works. We have this almost like an L-shaped profiles that stick out in each corner and sort of like hug the drive, Obviously it's not a toolless design, you have to use screws in order to secure them. I've actually ended up liking how it looks once I've tried putting some drives on there, just be careful when screwing them in, they are a bit fragile and they can easily bend. When it comes to cooling solutions, adding on to what I mentioned previously, on the front you can go for up to 360mm radiator, but be aware of your power supply length. I had a pretty beefy 170mm long Seasonics Prime TX power supply model with 140mm fan, which would probably push the cage to its most front position, limiting you to a 240mm radiator, so have that in mind, as well as the fact that there is room to do a push-pull configuration, as there is enough space for the fans behind the chassis front panel. Speaking of that, there's a rather interesting solution when it comes to pulling it off in a form of this tab on the bottom instead of a cutout that you usually grab onto. Its implementation is kinda clumsy because you have to tip over the chassis in order to get to it because you just can't get your fingers through and then you can pull it off, which also requires a little bit more force than usual, so you kinda feel like you're going to break something. Anyhow, I digress, back to the cooling setup possibilities. On the back you can put 120mm radiator, but on the top you can put up to 240mm radiators in case your RAM doesn't exceed 32mm of height, which, well, most of the today's blingy looking RAM do, since there's not that much room left between the chassis top panel and motherboard's edge. Even something like Corsair's Vengeance LPX is 31mm tall, so take that into consideration. This also suggests that there is not that much room left around the CPU cooler for you to handle the 12V EPS cable, especially if you have a big air CPU cooler, so make sure that you route that cable prior to putting the motherboard with the cooler on. I've burned myself a couple of times not doing this beforehand, so it's a good practice regardless of the chassis and build. All of those intake spots have a dust filter covering their back, one big magnetic on the top which is flush with the panel, which you've probably noticed by now. There's also one on the front panel, actually two small removable ones on each side, and a big one in the middle, sort of like a half-baked mesh filter, for which you're probably better off cleaning it right here as it is. There's one filter for the power supply on the bottom, which was a bit, well, let me just say challenging to put back. On the other hand, the power supply won't have any problems taking cold air into itself, since the chassis stands on pretty tall feet, carrying a dense foam as a form of padding. 
Oh yeah, I almost forgot we have two installation spots on the top of the power supply shroud for 120mm fans. But I don't think that can improve anything since we have hot air coming beneath them from the power supply and drives. Speaking of getting hot... I've used pretty much my standard configuration for my chassis testing, AMD's Ryzen 7 3700X paired with Noctua's NHU12S Chromax Black CPU cooler and Sapphire's RX 5600 XT Pulse graphics card so I can pump some heat into it. I won't go too deep into analysis because this depends greatly from configuration to configuration, but as you can see here, everything was in line temperature wise, nothing out of the ordinary, actually very close to my open testbed testing, even with fans running at default motherboard's fan speed, with a minor improvement when blasted at full speed on the CPU temperature and a bit more on the GPU temperature. Most of this performance, besides the sheer amount of fans, comes from the fact that we have that big airy mesh front panel. Since I'm already mentioning full speed, just like with the RG6 V, the fans are not that loud when the motherboard takes control over the fan speed with its default values, while at their full speed they do get a bit loud as there is 4 of them after all, plus speeds above 2000 RPM will do that with a 120mm fan as you will now hear. So, in conclusion, is this chassis perfect? No, no it's not of course, nothing is ever perfect, it has its cons as every other product out there, but does it come close to it when you take into consider what it represents in its segment, a value budget choice that looks good and has a decent amount of features? Well, that it certainly does. That's it for this time for me, thank you once again for watching, please take a second to toss me a thumbs up if you enjoyed my content, that really helps a lot. And if you like what you saw, feel free to subscribe. And if you already are, be sure to press that notification bell down below so you don't miss out on a new video. And until then, catch you later, guys.